Hello there and welcome to Nerd Roamer. This is the podcast where we believe that the entire world can be a field trip. Learn more about the world you explore by visiting our website at nerdroamer.com, checking us out on Instagram or Twitter, or subscribing to our podcast on Podbean, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts. Do you like our new theme song? The name of that song is Places I've Been, sent to us by a listener named Johnny Hogg. If you are wondering how we could get such a smooth, stylish guitarist to send us such a lovely track, I will clue you in on the fact that Johnny Hogg is my dad, and he does a great job. So, thanks Johnny. Stay groovy. Alright, to today's episode. Today is going to be a great day, and I will tell you why. Because we are going to be talking about dinosaurs. A topic that I'm sure many of you out there love because I know that many of the people listening to this at some point went through a dinosaur phase. How do I know that? Because you are all nerds. And if you think you're not a nerd, you are wrong because if you clicked on this podcast and you're listening to it, you are at least an honorary nerd. So I hereby dub you a nerd even if you don't identify as such yet at this point. By the end of this episode, you will identify as a dinosaur nerd because dinosaurs are freaking cool. Now, dinosaurs, you might tell yourself, it seems like an odd choice for a travel podcast because very broad topic, not really specific to any area. It seems like kind of a weird choice. But I will tell you, au contraire, this is a fantastic topic because this can apply to trips that you would take just about anywhere you'd want to go. Dinosaur fossils have been found on every continent, including Antarctica, as well as all 50 states. Some of the best dinosaur dig sites in the entire world are found in America, particularly out west in Montana, Utah, Colorado. There's a whole freaking national monument that exists basically to protect dinosaur dig sites named creatively Dinosaur National Monument in Utah and Colorado. And on top of that, there are loads of great museums that you can visit to see dinosaur fossils. So... You can go check out some dinosaur fossils, even if you're taking a city vacation. You got natural history museums, you got the classics, you got New York, you got Chicago, you got the Smithsonian in D.C. And on top of that, some of these smaller museums that you'll find in western cities, if you're out on your trip, you're having a city day, driving across the country. The Natural History Museum in Utah, Salt Lake City, has a tremendous collection of ceratops fossils. It's got some great allosaurus fossils. My favorite dinosaur museum has got to be the Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, Montana. Just absolutely fantastic. You can spend hours in there. I've done that multiple times. Really, really great place to visit. Highly recommend it. Now, I was talking before about going through a dinosaur phase, and I have got to confess to you, I was definitely one of those kids that was obsessed with dinosaurs. For me, kind of the first spark that got me interested in dinosaurs, or one of the first memories I have of being really, really into dinosaurs, was actually a TV special put out by Golden Book Videos made by Will Vinton. It was this claymation TV special. And all I could remember when I was thinking about this TV special was I remembered that it starred Fred Savage, you know, the cheeky little boy from The Princess Bride and from The Wonder Years, which is an awesome TV show. You've got to check that one out if you haven't seen it. So you got Fred Savage, cheeky little Fred Savage, and I remember the plot being you know, that he was trying to write a report for school about dinosaurs and he was having a hard time having some writer's block and then like a disembodied voice comes and teaches him about dinosaurs using claymation. And if it sounds pretty trippy, I went back and watched it on YouTube and yeah, it's pretty weird, but it was it was great. It was a great movie, very educational TV special, and it ignited a huge, huge interest in dinosaurs for me. The name of the special, if you want to find it online, you can find it on YouTube. It's called Dinosaurs, exclamation point, hyphen, a fun-filled trip back in time, exclamation point. This is made by Will Vinton. It's really, really great. Even if you aren't into dinosaurs, if you're just into claymation, he's the guy who made the California Raisins, Academy Award-winning animator. Really, really great. So check it out. Now, as anyone who continues to listen to this podcast will know, birds are near and dear to my heart. I love birds. And thus, in addition to the fact that I was really into dinosaurs as a child, I am stoked about this episode. Because I will tell you right now, this is the first bombshell revelation of this podcast. 
the dinosaurs never went extinct. You see them every day, flying around you. These are birds. Birds are actually dinosaurs. You don't believe me? That's okay. But I'll tell you right now, birds are dinosaurs. I will prove it to you. And to take it a step further, as we will see, part of the definition of being a dinosaur is that dinosaurs are a subset of reptiles. So this means that birds are actually reptiles. Aha! Now I know I did it. I can't see you right now, but I know you just choked on a croissant. If you are having trouble coughing it up, seek medical attention. I can't help you through the radio. You think I'm full of it, but I am right, and I will prove it to you. And we are going to have a lot of fun along the way. So, now that I've baited you into listening to this episode, let's back up and get into the nitty gritty here, and let's talk about what a dinosaur actually is. So, what is a dinosaur? So, as we've established, a dinosaur is a reptile. So, it is a type of reptile. Beyond that point, it kind of depends on which strategy you want to take, how precise you want to nail it down. So let's just get ultra scientific about this. The modern approach to classifying organisms is a little bit different than I learned in my textbooks from school, which were, you know, 30 years old and had like a million kids names written on the inside cover. You know, I feel like what you learn in school, I learned this like taxonomy where it was animals were just put in these kind of basic groups and no one ever really mentioned what the interrelation of the different groups was. It was just kind of based on the way they looked or kind of their characteristics. It was like you had mammals, you had birds, you had reptiles. And they didn't didn't really get into how those different groups related to each other. The more modern scientific approach to classifying organisms is to look at organisms and then look at their shared characteristics and common ancestors to construct these family trees to see what the relationships between different classes of organisms are. So... People will call this phylogenetics or cladistics. They'll talk about grouping animals into different clades. And really, this is all about looking for relationships. Now, this can be done in a number of different ways. You can look at shared anatomic or morphologic features, behaviors. Very commonly for organisms that are more contemporary to us, you'll look at DNA sequencing. And what you're looking for are features that pop up in an ancestor that can then be traced down through different generations. These vagaries they'll call these synapomorphies so for birds and other and and certain other dinosaurs there are some very important synapomorphies there's actually technically over a hundred but some of the main ones are having three-toed feet having these hard-shelled oblong eggs that are laid in nests with a brooding behavior they've got a wishbone you'll see feathers certain shapes to the wrist bones the presence of hollow bones There's like a number of characteristics that tie birds into certain types of dinosaurs as we'll get into. By using a phylogenetic approach, scientists define a dinosaur, and this varies slightly. There's different arguments about this. This debate, I will tell you exactly how to define a dinosaur. It's not 100% been settled, and there are people that have different opinions. But loosely, it goes something like this. They will define the dinosaur as being any sort of creature that can name its most recent common ancestor as one that's shared by Triceratops, Diplodocus, which are two non-avian dinosaurs we'll talk about, along with Passer domesticus, which you probably see every single day and pay no mind to. That's the common house sparrow. It's an invasive species on many continents. Those common dirty little birds, they're basically like, I love birds, but my goodness, they're like flying mice. Um, So, This might seem like cheating, kind of including the bird in the definition, but if you start to drill down on trying to look at what in your mind you picture a dinosaur being, the only way to really get that entire group, but just that group of creatures, is to use a definition like the one I just mentioned. So that's really how you get all those creatures that in your mind you would even think of as being non-avian dinosaurs in the same group. Now, people spend their entire lives studying cladistics, studying phylogeny. And so thinking about evolutionary biology and phylogenetic trees is making your head hurt. The close enough for government work, simple enough definition for most people who are not scientists would be to think of a dinosaur as being any reptile that walks with its hind legs held erect beneath the body rather than sprawled to the side the way you'd see a Gila monster's legs or, you know, a I don't know, any other 
gecko, any other sort of lizard's legs, you know, how they're always kind of sprawled to the side. Dinosaurs, kind of their unique characteristic that, that was shared was that they had their legs held erect below them. Now, we will see when we're talking about the development of the dinosaurs, there were some other classes of reptiles that had the legs held under them at times, but it wasn't the same kind of like supportive hip girdle that the dinosaurs had. All right, so now that we've kind of got out of the way what a dinosaur is, what we're talking about, let's talk about the dino story a little bit. What's the story of dinosaurs? Where did these guys come from? Dinosaurs, so that word was coined in the 1800s by paleontologists that were studying these fossils they were digging up from the ground. The word comes from Greek, meaning terrible lizard. The dinosaurs, so this is very important, think of them in your mind as being synonymous with the Mesozoic era. So the Mesozoic era stretched from about 240 million years ago to about 66, 65 million years ago. That's the Mesozoic era. Currently, we're living in the Cenozoic era. Prior to the Mesozoic era was the Paleozoic era. Mesozoic era is the age of dinosaurs. This was a time when the dinosaurs were able to kind of rumble into a relatively clean slate thanks to the largest mass extinction event in the history of the world. The preceding, so the Permian Age was the last age of the Paleozoic Era, twilight of the Paleozoic Era, and during the Permian Age, the Earth had seen an explosion of biodiversity. For reasons not entirely clear, might have something to do with the meteor impact, toxic gas, global anoxia, that sounds very scary. I hope that doesn't happen while I'm alive, that sounds terrifying. Around 80% of the world species were lost over a very short time frame. This event at the end of the Permian Age goes by a number of different names because it preceded the Triassic Age of the Mesozoic. People will call it the PT extinction event. Sometimes people will call it the Great Dying because it was the largest extinction event, which I think is an incredibly melodramatic name, and I absolutely am in love with it. I think that that's fantastic. Strong work, whoever coined that term. What we see is Permian Age end with this mass extinction, setting up the Triassic Age. The thing to know about the Permian Age is that conditions for life on Earth were pretty cushy. For example, very temperate climate across the whole globe, growing these like really lush, fern-like forests. Uh, and the forests were so lush that when they died out at the end of the Permian Age, all of that dead organic matter became actually a lot of the coal on Earth. It comes from the dead organic material of the dead forests of the Permian Age. There were reptiles, but there were no dinosaurs or anything like that. So PT extinction event happens, and another geologic event occurs during this time, which is the fusion of the continents into Pangaea. This ushers in the Triassic Age. The Triassic Age is characterized by the Earth taking on a very harsh climate, because you've got this one really big landmass. There's not very much moderating influence from the ocean. So you've got this huge landmass with this vast interior desert that has very hot, dry conditions, exchanging with very cold, harsh conditions, wide temperature swings, just not very conducive to growing like a ton of large life forms in comparison to some of the other ages we're going to talk about. So really harsh climate during the Triassic Age. Radioactive dating for the beginning of the Triassic Age places this at starting around 240 million years ago. In the setting of the Triassic Age, we do start to see larger reptiles take over as dominant land animals. Reptiles that are kind of maybe related to dinosaurs, but they aren't really necessarily precursors of dinosaurs. They're just large reptiles. The Triassic Age does see some large quadrupedal reptiles as being the dominant land animals. Dinosaurs, while they did come into existence, were mostly kind of smallish, one to two meters long. They kind of served kind of a predatory or scavenging role during this time. We did not see the kind of like huge dinosaurs like we're going to talk about later on coming on the scene during the Triassic. The end of the Triassic is also when we'll start to see some of the first mammals or kind of like precursor mammals come about. The Triassic lasted for roughly 40 million years until there was another mass extinction event that was not quite as big as the PT extinction event we talked about, but this extinction event did manage to wipe out a lot of the non-dinosaur terrestrial animals and basically leave a clean slate, clean dance floor for the dinosaurs to waltz out onto. You've got the Pangaea continent breaking up. This may be related to a huge volcanic event in the central Atlantic area. This is evidenced by 
when you look at continents that surround the Atlantic, when you look at areas on North America, South America, Africa, Europe, you'll find this volcanic rock that seems to be shared in common between them, indicating that perhaps there was some volcanic event at the center of this area that then maybe drove some of these continents apart. And this magmatic area is called the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. So sometimes if you're reading about dinosaurs, they might talk about camp. And so that's what that is. It's this shared volcanic rock that's evidence of this Pangaea, this supercontinent starting to break up. The Jurassic and Cretaceous periods are when we're really going to see the dinosaurs become kings of the earth. As Ian Malcolm would tell you, life uh, finds a way. Thanks to Jurassic Park, the Jurassic period has become the most synonymous period with dinosaurs in the minds of the public. During this 60 million year period from 200 million to 140 million years ago or so, the dinosaurs moved in to fill these ecological vacuums that we had talked about. The Jurassic period gets its name from the Jura Mountains in Central Europe, where layers from this time period were first identified. In North America, the Jurassic is famously represented in part by the Morrison Formation, which is one of the most productive fossil rock layers in history. It was the focus of the Bone Wars in the 1800s, which was this huge conflict over fossils between a couple of prominent paleontologists at that time. Morrison sites can be found throughout the Great Plains, and two of the most well-known are at Dinosaur National Monument, actually in Colorado and Utah, and at Utah's Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry, which is on the San Rafael Swell, right in the middle of the state. So with Pangaea breaking up during the Jurassic, you start to get a greater percentage of land having more of a maritime influence, which is more temporizing in terms of temperature, provides a little bit more consistent moisture, and you start to see the climate become more wet and lush again with these lush forests and savannas replacing the vast interior desert of Pangaea. If you want a picture in your mind's eye, these forests during the Jurassic consist of these thick conifer canopies with lush, ferny undergrowth. We don't have flowers yet, really. We don't have deciduous trees the way we do now. So it's these kind of pine and fern forests cover the land. Dinosaurs were booming during this time. And this is when we see several of the kind of main lineages of dinosaurs develop. And again, this is getting into some specialized evolutionary biology that not all scientists agree on the exact relationships here, but I'm just going to give you some of the basics. One of the main groups of dinosaurs that arises that you should know about are the ornithischian herbivores. So ornithischian, you might hear ornith. You hear ornith. Where have I heard that before? So like an ornithologist. It's like somebody who studies birds. So this is talking about ornithischian. The ischium is part of your hip. Ischium, hip, ornith, birds. Ornithischian dinosaurs have hips that to early paleontologists bore a striking resemblance to birds. You're going to see when we're talking about the definition of dinosaurs, when we're talking about classifying dinosaurs, it's all about the hips, baby. The hips don't lie, as someone might say. Anyway, the ornithischian herbivores, ironically, are not the lineage of dinosaurs that would eventually give rise to birds. This is a class of dinosaurs that has some really, really classic great dinosaurs in it that most people will be familiar with. Dinosaurs like the Stegosaurus. Dinosaurs like the Ankylosaurus. They weren't all herbivores, but many of them were herbivores. And this is not the class of dinosaurs that's going to give rise to, you know, like T-Rex and stuff like that. We'll get into them in a second. So the next group of dinosaurs to think about, hey, we're talking about the hips again, the Sorician dinosaurs. So Sorician, soar, you might recognize from dinosaur, terrible lizard. Soar means lizard, so Sorician is lizard-hipped dinosaurs. Their hips are more like the hips that you would classically see in lizards. There's two kind of side branches here. And again, this is uh, somewhat controversial, but ones to think about here are the sauropods. So these are those massive dinosaurs. They're quadrupedal. Think like Brachiosaurus, Brontosaurus, Diplodocus, that kind of dinosaur, you know, with the big long neck and the long tail and that kind of thing. And the final group we're going to talk about are the theropods. So the theropods are also sericians. This is a really diverse group of dinosaurs that were bipedal. This group includes most of the predatory dinosaurs that you would think of. So these are your Allosauruses, your Velociraptors, T-Rexes. Those dinosaurs are theropods. Theropods are also the dinosaurs that had hollow bones and three-toed feet that would go on to beget avian dinosaurs, birds. 
notice I have not mentioned pterodactyls yet. I haven't mentioned pterosaurs. I haven't mentioned pterodactyls. This class of flying reptiles became more widespread during this time, very, very prominent during the Jurassic. However, not dinosaurs. So they don't have the same hip structure. They're just morphologically really different from dinosaurs. Super cool animals. The first flying vertebrates, really, really massive, ruled the skies for millions of years. Not dinosaurs. Same goes for plesiosaurs and those other kind of swimming Mesozoic beasts you'll see. Also don't have the same morphology. Not dinosaurs. The transition to the Cretaceous was not as drastic as from the Triassic to the Jurassic. It was kind of more of a gradual blend sort of situation. The continents continued to break apart and drift apart. And what you saw during the Cretaceous is species becoming more unique on each continent because they're becoming separated from one another and developing separately. The Cretaceous period is really where the money's at in terms of dinosaur biodiversity. It represented the bulk of the age of dinosaurs lasting from 140 million years ago to 65 million years ago when the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event would wipe non-avian dinosaurs off the earth entirely until John Hammond brings them back. Now I just want you to think about that time frame for a second. We are closer in time right now, you are listening to this, to the time of the Cretaceous period, to the time of the T-Rex and the Triceratops, than the Triceratops was to the very first dinosaur in the Triassic. Because that was 240 million years ago to 66 million years versus 66 million years to today. The Cretaceous period dinosaurs were 180 million years away from the very first dinosaurs, whereas we are only 65, 66 million years away. Think about that. Dinosaurs ruled the Earth for the Mesozoic era, which lasted 180 million years. That is super cool and absolutely wild. By the end of the Cretaceous, there was mammal biodiversity. Birds had established themselves on land. There were other animals around, but it was still very much the age of dinosaurs. You look out across the land and you would say, the earth was really ruled by dinosaurs. But that would all change on a very, very terrible day, 66 million years ago. Nerd rumor. But before we play the dinosaurs out, let's take a step back and marvel at these creatures because they are super awesome. And you listen to this podcast because you wanted to know more fun dinosaur facts. So let's start with some dinosaur physiology because I think that that is really interesting and I felt like I was taught a lot of misconceptions about dinosaur physiology. So let's just take their large size into perspective for a second. The largest dinosaurs were sauropods, so that's like the Brachiosaurus, Brontosaurus, Diplodocus. They were the largest of all dinosaurs. So the largest sauropods measured 85 feet long or longer and weighed 50 to 60,000 pounds. That is huge. But despite their immense size, their brains were about a quarter the size of a human being's brain. So think about that. That's maybe like the size of a small dog's brain for this huge creature that was probably the largest land animal to ever walk the earth. Very small brain to body weight ratio, probably pretty dumb animals. There is a misconception that they carried a second brain in their sacral area because it was too far from the tip of their tail to their regular brain for them to process nerve signals, but that has been debunked. So if you ever come across that or somebody tells you that, that is incorrect information. They did not have a second butt brain. They just had one regular brain and it was very small. The smallest dinosaur is technically the hummingbird. Ah, I got you with the birds thing again. But since we're talking about dinosaurs, you're really probably more interested in non-avian dinosaurs right now. So know that the smallest non-avian dinosaurs were about a foot long. An example of a small dinosaur would be the Micropachycephalosaurus, which was a two-legged herbivorous dinosaur that was about the size of your neighbor Shih Tzu. Maybe a little bigger. Maybe like a Cocker Spaniel. I don't know. I don't know what kind of dog your neighbor has. It probably barks a lot when they're at work. Next question that comes up for consideration is, were dinosaurs warm-blooded or were they cold-blooded? Now, I've seen reptiles. I've seen them at the zoo. I've seen them out in nature. I've seen iguanas, lizards, and they're always sunning themselves on rocks because they're cold-blooded and they need the heat of the sun to rev up their metabolism. What's the deal with dinosaurs? Were they warm-blooded or cold-blooded? Because if they're cold-blooded, like, man, you need a lot of sun to warm that body up. First of all, it depends on what you mean by warm-blooded. So let's talk a little bit about what that means. One definition or one way to think about warm-bloodedness is the concept of endothermy, 
which is to say that you generate or you achieve your body heat by burning fat and using your mitochondria to generate heat internally to keep a constant body temperature. There's also this idea that warm-bloodedness implies a fast metabolism. These days, all warm-blooded creatures burn 10 times the calories of cold-blooded creatures, which is great for being able to like maintain constant activity and maintain your constant body temperature, but man, do you have to eat a lot of food to keep up that amount of calories. Third way to think about warm-bloodedness is this idea of it being homeothermy which is maintaining a constant body temperature. If you are a cold-blooded reptile of current times, you aren't necessarily always going to have a perfectly constant body temperature because you are subject to whatever the ambient temperatures are. And you try to adjust your body position and your behavior to achieve a body temperature, but you don't have direct control over it, and so you don't have homeothermy the same way that a mammal would, for example. There is some evidence for warm-bloodedness in dinosaurs. So for one, the canals in the bones of dinosaurs are very similar to those in birds and very similar to those in other warm-blooded creatures. They have this fibrolamellar bone structure that indicates rapid growth that would be typical of a warm-blooded creature. Warm-blooded creatures have faster metabolism and they grow faster than cold-blooded creatures do. Some people have estimated that if dinosaurs were cold-blooded, it would take them 100 years to grow to full size because of their slow metabolism. The fibrolamellar bone structure indicates faster growth, which indicates that they were probably warm-blooded. Two, you can look at the size of the blood vessel canals or holes left in the femurs to estimate the metabolic activity of an animal if you compare it to the size of the femur overall. That index is important for predicting warm-bloodedness. And... The index is higher than even that of humans, which definitely would favor potentially being warm-blooded for the dinosaurs. Also, I want you to think back to the hip structure of the dinosaurs. Like I said, the hips don't lie. It takes a heck of a lot more energy to stand upright. Even if you're quadrupedal, having upright hind legs that you have to maintain balance on is a lot more work than having legs that just lay out flat. Using more effort, using more calories to stand upright would be more consistent with a warm-blooded animal with a fast metabolism than a creature that's just in total energy conservation mode because it's cold-blooded and it doesn't take in as many calories. So standing upright also indicates probably being warm-blooded. All of the animals that we know today that stand upright are warm-blooded. Fourth piece of evidence is a quick hitter. Birds, as we mentioned, are dinosaurs, and they are warm-blooded. Evidence for cold-bloodedness includes the fact that crocodiles, which are the closest living relatives of dinosaurs besides birds, crocodiles are cold-blooded. So their closest living reptiles, aside from their descendants, are cold-blooded. So maybe that indicates that they were also cold-blooded. Although crocodiles are kind of a weird metabolic example because they have some overlap features of warm-bloodedness and cold-bloodedness. For example, crocodiles have a four-chambered heart just like dinosaurs and birds do, whereas most cold-blooded reptiles have a three-chambered heart. Crocodiles also have the same fibrolamellar bone structure and grow fast the way that we think dinosaurs probably did. So there's some features that might suggest warm-bloodedness, some that might suggest cold-bloodedness, but then we have to suggest a possible third option, which is to say dinosaurs are still somewhat of an unknown entity to us. We don't have anything fully comparable to these large, gigantic land animals anymore. Maybe they had a unique metabolism that we don't even fully understand that's neither warm-blooded nor cold-blooded. There is actually a lot of evidence for this. There is evidence that the growth rate of dinosaurs, and thus probably their metabolism, increased with their size. So the larger they got, the faster their metabolism probably the higher their body temperature, the faster they'd be able to grow, the more they'd be able to move. This phenomenon of size-dependent metabolism is called gigantothermism. And the idea is that as your mass increases, as you become this huge, you know, whatever, brontosaurus, you are so large that your surface area to size ratio is a lot smaller than for a tiny creature. A lot of your metabolism can be maintained just through inertia. You've got this big, big body. It's really hard to change the temperature much one way or the other. So you're able to maintain homeothermy without having to take in as many calories because you've just got inertia on your side, basically, because you've got such a big body. This may have been true for larger 
species of dinosaurs, maybe smaller species of dinosaurs, might have been truly warm-blooded, might have been truly cold-blooded. It's hard to say. There's probably some variation there. So some dinosaurs had unique metabolism, whereas others would have developed cold or warm-bloodedness, depending on their situation. So probably a mixed bag, not a perfect answer there. Final physiology question. What's the deal with the appearance of these dinosaurs? Did they have feathers? I've heard some people say they have feathers. Did they have smooth skin? Did they have hair? What's the deal? So yes, all of the above actually. Skin impressions left by ceratopsian dinosaurs, so like triceratops and sauropods, have revealed that they probably had smooth, scaly skin, maybe somewhat similar to what you'd picture on a reptile today. Whereas there are also many examples that exist, especially in the theropod lineage, of dinosaurs that were covered in feathers. Now many of these feathers are not exactly like the feathers that you would see on a bird today in terms of being asymmetric and suited for flight. They may have been more for insulation or for mating displays or something like that. But there are certainly quite a few feathered dinosaurs that have been identified. And in further support of the dinosaur bird hypothesis, you've got fossils like Archaeopteryx, which are really morphologically more like dinosaurs, but have bird-like feathers on them and appear to be some sort of transition fossil between non-avian dinosaurs and avian dinosaurs. Some of the ornithischian dinosaurs also were found to have feathers, and some of these feathers were very, very thin and almost appeared hair-like, so you could say that they maybe even had hair. And so really, the appearance of the dinosaurs is really variable, and there was probably a whole gamut from completely smooth to some fine hairs, fine feathers, to transitional dinosaurs that had feathers that would look very familiar to us today as being very similar to bird feathers. Now, I can't do this podcast without talking about some of my favorite dinosaurs. I just can't do it. I made two top five lists that we're going to go through. First top five list is going to be what I consider the top five greatest hits dinosaurs and some fun facts. And the second list is going to be top five coolest dinosaurs you might not have heard of. Top five greatest hits. Let's do it. Number one, Stegosaurus. This guy is an ornithician. He's an herbivore of the late Jurassic period. You would know Stegosaurus because of its distinctive back plates. These were embedded in the skin, so you might think these were attached to the skeleton or something like this, depending on what museum you've been to. But they were actually in the skin, and it's unclear what they were for. There's some grooves in the plates that look like they might have been for blood vessels, so there may have been some heat or temperature regulation purpose for the back panels. It's also possible that they were for protection. We don't really know, but they are super cool looking. You can't deny that. Second dinosaur on the top five list, Triceratops, another ornithician, this time from the Cretaceous period. All the Ceratops dinosaurs are from the Cretaceous period. You know it from that distinctive frill. It's got the three horns and that beak-like mouth. The epic battles you'll see sometimes in these kind of campy old movies about dinosaurs where the T-Rex is fighting the Triceratops and they're going at it and finally the T-Rex, you know, it's all over if he gets behind the frill, right? You get behind the frill, it's all over for the Triceratops. That actually might be legit. They've found Triceratops skeletons that have T-Rex tooth marks on them and it's unclear if they were being scavenged or if they were fighting each other, but there's probably some predation there. And so you can go to bed easy tonight knowing that T-Rex and Triceratops actually did fight each other. And I bet it was super cool to watch. Next on the list, Brontosaurus. You may not realize it, but this is the most controversial dinosaur on this list. It's a sauropod of the Jurassic. They're herbivores. This is one of those big, you know, we were talking about them, the long neck and the long tail. Huge dinosaurs. The controversy about this dinosaur is whether it even exists or not. So in the late 1800s, the famed paleontologist O.C. Marsh, who was one of the guys from the Bone Wars that we referenced earlier, discovered some skeletons of these large sauropods in different areas of the West, named one of them Brontosaurus and one of them Apatosaurus. In 1903, another paleontologist named Riggs, there is just so much drama in the paleontology community, by the way, I just, you could, this would be a great soap opera. This would be a great TV show. Netflix original series here. But in 1903, uh, another paleontologist named Riggs described a skeleton that had features of both the Apatosaurus and Brontosaurus, and it was agreed upon that this quote-unquote Brontosaurus skeleton found by Marsh was not actually a separate species, and thus the name was dropped. It did live on in the minds of the public, 
because it's just a really catchy name. It was popularized in the Brontosaurus burgers that featured prominently in the Flintstones TV cartoon. It lived on in the minds of the public, but much like Pluto not really being a planet, Brontosaurus wasn't really a dinosaur until 2015. More specimens came to light that were more uniquely like the Brontosaurus skeleton that Marsh found in the 1800s, and the Brontosaurus was restored to its glorious status as an actual dinosaur species. There's still some controversy there, but I think it's safe to say Brontosaurus Burger is back on the menu. Fourth greatest hits dinosaur, Velociraptor. These were theropod carnivores of the late Cretaceous. They were made famous by the movie Jurassic Park. They're the, like these human-sized dinosaurs that were hunting the kids in the kitchen, and it was all very dramatic. They were very crafty and smart. They were smarter than the humans. There were a lot of inaccuracies in the way that they were depicted in the movie. So first of all, they were much smaller than those depicted in Jurassic Park. They were probably just about six feet from tip of the tail to tip of the nose. They only stood about two feet tall off the ground, and they were covered in feathers. So they were one of those feathered theropods that we talked about. As an example of more localized speciation with the continents drifting apart, they're primarily found in the Gobi Desert region of Asia. The dinosaur closest in size and shape to the movie Velociraptor is actually a dinosaur called Utah Raptor, which was a larger theropod and it can be found throughout the western U.S. And fun fact, as the name might suggest, it is the state dinosaur of Utah. And if you want to get even more confusing, Utah calling you out. I'm putting you on blast here. You not only have a state dinosaur named Utah Raptor, you also have a state fossil, the Allosaurus, and they are two rather similar appearing dinosaurs. So I think we're kind of double dipping here a little bit with the fossils, Utah, but dinosaurs are so cool, we're going to let it slide. Good on you for having a couple state dinosaur fossil things there. Final of the top five most famous greatest hits dinosaurs, can't have this list without Tyrannosaurus. This was a large theropod, not the largest, but one of the largest theropods of the late Cretaceous. It was naturally, natch, it was a carnivore. Weighing 15,000 pounds, it had 60 teeth and a skull five feet long. Its bite was three times stronger than any creature currently alive on Earth today. It was capable of pulverizing bones so finely that they find bone dust in its poops. You can find fossilized poops apparently, and they find bone dust in the T-Rex poo. It is unclear to what extent the Tyrannosaurus was actually hunting its prey versus scavenging. We know from today a lot of our large predators that are alive nowadays do a lot of scavenging. Some hunting, but a lot of scavenging. I'm looking at two grizzly bears from the last episode. So it's unclear, but man, five foot long skull, 60 teeth, strong bite. Seems pretty scary. I wouldn't want to mess with it either way. Now we're going to hop into our list of the top five coolest dinosaurs you may not have heard of. The first one is a little bit more mainstream, but it's super cool, so I had to include it, and that's the Ankylosaurus. This is an armored dinosaur that lived in the Cretaceous, and this is the one, if you've ever seen pictures of it, it looks basically like a little tank. You know, it looks like a turtle, and then it's got this big club tail in the back that was used for defending itself. Next dinosaur on the list is the Dreadnought. As you can guess by the fact that the dinosaur is considered a titanosaur, it was very large. It was 85 feet long at least and was capable of reaching, so from with its feet on the ground, with its head as high as it could go, it could reach into a six-story building nowadays if it was alive. The neck was 40 feet long and then it stood on shoulders 20 feet tall. Crazy huge dinosaur, the dreadnought. Next on the list, the Pachycephalosaurus. Another Cretaceous dinosaur, you're just seeing the biodiversity here in the Cretaceous period. You're kind of seeing it on display. The heart of the age of dinosaurs. The Pachycephalosaurus was a Cretaceous dinosaur with a very thick skull. So when I say thick skull, you're probably picturing one, two inches thick, something like that. No, no, no. Au contraire. This dinosaur's skull was nine or ten inches thick. Nine or ten inches thick. That's crazy. This was... I mean, you can't have a skull like that and not use it to ram things, right? I mean, if I did, that's what I would use it for. It's unclear if this was used for headbutting other dinosaurs the way rams headbutt each other today, or if they would kind of sideswipe each other, or if it was mainly for just self-defense. But it was definitely used for hitting something, and it was super thick, and I bet they did a lot of damage. Next on the list, Spinosaurus. 
Spinosaurus is cool, is the largest carnivorous dinosaur found to date. It was a meat-eating theropod, and it had this cool, like, sail thing on its back, kind of like a marlin or something like that. Really, really neat. It was much longer than the T-Rex or Gigantosaurus, and so it was the largest carnivore of all time. Another cool fact about the Spinosaurus is that it was probably a swimmer, and thus is the first known swimming dinosaur because we mentioned before that there were other marine reptiles but this is the first marine dinosaur that's been described so that is very very cool last on our list of indie kind of deep cut dinosaurs is going to be the cosmoceratops this was the frilliest and most horned of the ceratops so kind of think of your triceratops with its three horns and then be like why not add 12 more because this guy had 15 horns and probably lived in herds, a lot of these uh, ceratopsians were probably kind of like herd-dwelling animals. They lived in the swamps that covered southern Utah, rocking out with its big, frilly, horned head. I think it's kind of fitting that we end with the ceratops, the quintessential Cretaceous dinosaur, because we are coming to the end of the road. More on that after the break. Well, you know what they say, all good things must come to an end. And as the birds, or maybe they could be renamed the dinosaurs, but I hope they'd keep the Y instead of the I, the birds would sing, to everything, turn, 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 there is a season, turn, turn, turn. And for dinosaurs, that turn came 65 million years ago. Just think about the biodiversity we talked about during the Cretaceous. Think about the land being ruled by dinosaurs and Place yourself there looking out across the landscape. It would have been very hard to imagine a world without dinosaurs, but very quickly one developed. While there is a possibility that there may have been a slight die-off of dinosaurs before the Great Extinction, basically there is a line in the fossil record 65 million years ago where you've got a ton of dinosaurs and then you have got a whole lot of nothing. In the geologic blink of an eye, 70% of the Earth species were gonzo. But why? So for years, scientists speculated about this, and nobody had a great answer. Volcanic eruptions, disease. Then, in 1980, a discovery in Italy shedded some light on the situation. Just above the final layer of sediment that contained fossils, so anything above a layer is likely more recent, anything below a layer is likely older, right? Things pile up, that's how it works. Just above the final layer of sediment containing fossils, scientists in Gubbio, Italy, discovered a clay layer that was very rich in iridium, with concentrations a thousand times higher than any previously described. This was super unusual, because iridium is a very rare element on the Earth's surface. But there is one place that iridium is very common, and that is on asteroids and meteors. So scientists kind of puzzled over this, and they began to seek out this layer of sediment in other locations around the world. And they repeatedly uncovered the same phenomenon, a single one-centimeter layer of iridium-rich clay dating back 65 million years. The size of the meteor needed to create such a worldwide deposition of that material would have needed to be six miles in diameter. Six miles in diameter? Where is the crater? If you've got a meteor that big hitting the Earth, there is going to be a crater somewhere. Skeptics were perplexed. And then the crater was found. The most likely spot of impact for a meteor large enough to cause the worldwide iridium distribution is located at the tip of the Yucatan Peninsula. The Chicxulub Crater was discovered by oil companies in the 1970s and 80s. Analysis in 1990 showed that it was the leading candidate for the extinction of the dinosaurs. How did they determine this? So for starters, the crater is consistent with the size of meteor estimated to be needed to create a worldwide iridium deposition. So it's the right size. Probably was made by a meteor 6 to 10 miles wide. Second, radioisotype dating estimates the age of the crater as being 65 million years old. So the date checks out, the size checks out. Third, Fish fossils have been found that date to the time of the exact extinction event and the time of the crater that contain meteorite debris in their gills. 
So this constellation points to there being a large meteor that could have caused this worldwide iridium deposition. And it seems to have hit at the exact same time that we see the dinosaurs go out of business. So that all seems to fit with that being a large reason why the dinosaurs went extinct. A meteor strike the size of the one at Chicxulub would have released as much energy as nearly one trillion of the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The crater itself is 93 miles wide and 12 miles deep and would have generated a tsunami wave over a mile high. Locally, shock waves from the impact, fires, winds, earthquakes, and debris would have wiped out life instantaneously. Globally, the darkening of the atmosphere from the fallout of the meteor impact would have led to global cooling, acid rain, and famine for all living creatures. The creatures that weren't immediately killed by the impact would have died out eventually from these effects. Dinosaurs were uniquely susceptible to dying out an event like this because they were on average quite large creatures if you remember. Because of their large size and the fact that they probably had some larger metabolic requirements because they were probably at least somewhat warm-blooded, meant that they couldn't survive these periods of famine very well at all. They also were too large to be able to burrow into the ground and hide out anywhere from the debris. So smaller mammals, smaller birds, had lower metabolic demands and were better able to survive in a low food supply situation than the dinosaurs were. Similarly, some of the more modestly sized ectotherms, like the other reptiles, crocodiles, things like that, were able to conserve enough energy that they could kind of skate by on scavenging dead creatures and lay low until conditions improved. So they were able to survive the extinction event for that reason. In general, we see during this time that omnivores and scavengers tended to survive and fare better than the animals that were true herbivores, as did the animals that lived on the ocean floor. Ultimately, there may have been some other factors that contributed to the dinosaurs being wiped out, such as changes in the sea level, volcanic activity, and it's unclear from the fossil record exactly if there had been any extinction occurring before the impact of the meteor or not. Generally, most scientists think that this large meteor impact was the main event that caused the extinction of the dinosaurs at that time. There is some evidence that a few straggling species of dinosaurs limped along for a few years after the impact, but ultimately they too also perished. And now we're left with avian dinosaurs only. The age of dinosaurs, the terrible lizards that ruled the land is over. All right, thanks for listening to that episode. You know I can't leave you at the end of an episode without a knowledge nugget, some little tidbit of information that I think you'd find interesting and informative. And so for today's knowledge nugget, we are gonna talk about how the heck does radioisotope dating work anyway? How exactly do scientists estimate the age of different rock layers like the ones we've been talking about? Let's start with some basics. Everything around us, from rocks to TikTok stars, are made from atoms. There are over 200 different types of atoms, each being considered a separate element. Elements are differentiated from one another based on the number of protons in the nucleus, or core, of the atom. The nucleus also contains neutral particles called neutrons, and different flavors of each element can contain different numbers of neutrons called isotopes. So for example, you can have carbon-14, which has 14 particles in its core, or carbon-12, which has 12. Atoms are not perfectly stable. Nothing is. Although most of the people I know named Adam are actually very stable, calm individuals. But atoms in general are not perfectly stable. Each tends to lose neutrons or protons at a certain rate that's constant and predictable. For example, if you had a pile of carbon-14 and kept checking on it every so often, you would find that after 5,370 years, exactly half your pile would have lost two of their neutrons to become carbon-12. This rate is constant, doesn't depend on pressure, temperature, movement, none of that. Thus, if you were to look at someone else's random pile of carbon-14, you could measure what percentage had turned to carbon-12 and figure out when they left their pile. This is useful information to have when submitting a complaint to your HOA about the neighbors leaving their eyesore of a carbon-14 pile next to your nice, freshly mowed lawn. I just don't think Gary understands what this is going to do to my home value. Carbon-14 is great for dating organic matter on Earth, 
as rates in the atmosphere seem to be constant, mostly, and it accrues in the body at a predictable rate. The clock, quote-unquote, on carbon-14 decay begins at death for living creatures. Carbon-14's short half-life makes it useful only for dating things 60,000 years or younger, as anything older than that will have amounts of carbon-14 left that are so small that they can't be measured precisely enough to be useful. So fortunately, when we're looking at dinosaurs, there are other elements with longer half-lives. As a final example, when zirconium silicon, which is different from zirconium oxide, which is what the ring that turned your finger green in high school was made of, is formed from hot magma. It is made up of a lattice of these zirconium silica compounds in this kind of crystal format. So this is found in a lot of igneous rocks around the earth, ones that came from magma or volcanic activity. Occasionally, when these zirconium crystals are being made, a stray uranium that's just floating around randomly can get incorporated into the crystal in the place of zirconium because it has kind of a similar shape, a similar size, similar essence to the zirconium. So it fits into that lattice kind of by happenstance. One thing that definitely can't be incorporated into the zirconium lattice is lead. It just doesn't form lattices as well as the uranium does. As it just so happens, an isotope of uranium-235 will decay into lead-207 with time the way that carbon-14 decays into carbon-12. And it also does that at a rate that's constant and predictable. Thus, since the uranium had to be incorporated in the igneous zirconium-containing rock at the time, at the exact time of its formation, one knows that the starting point at which the radioactive decay clock started ticking is when that rock was formed. And you know that any trace of lead found in that rock has to be the result of radioactive decay and can't just be lead that randomly contaminated the rock. So by measuring the ratio of uranium-235 to lead-207, just like when you measured your neighbor's ugly pile of carbon-14, bam, you know exactly how old the rock is. The half-life of uranium-235 is 700 million years, so it's well suited to the older rock samples we're talking about when looking at the Earth's geologic history. There are many other methods of radioisotope dating using different elements that work in similar ways, but now you understand some of the basic principles. And now go clean up your carbon piles before you get fined by your HOA. I've heard that Nancy's out there writing tickets as we speak. I want to thank you all so much for listening to this episode of Nerd Roamer. Please, if you enjoyed this podcast, give us a like, subscribe to us, Download some more of our episodes, leave a review, follow us on Instagram and Twitter, visit our website at nerdroamer.com for some notes on the show and extra resources, and definitely tell a friend. If there's a topic that you'd love to see on a future episode, definitely feel free to shoot us a message and let us know. This particular episode came to us because of a suggestion from listener Erica, so we want to say thank you, Erica, for giving us the great suggestion for this episode. Couldn't have been more happy about how it turned out. And to all you nerd roamers out there who want to learn more about the world you explore, till next time, roam wisely.